Okay, cool. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> I don't even know if I know how to post this to YouTube yet, but someday I'll figure it out. <laughs> you have some time. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you quarantining? How are you self-isolating right now? Gosh, um, well, I'm with my parents, and uh, I got out of the city. Um, we're just staying in the house, staying indoors, only leaving when we have to. And I'm just trying to, like, fill my time taking classes, like, taking uh, French on Rosetta Stone. Oh, yay. Um, watching Netflix. I know you would know something about French lessons. <laughs> well, I, I try. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um so, yeah, we're just, you know, enjoying family time. It's definitely, like, uh, stressful and, you know, saddening, frustrating when you sort of lose, especially as artists. But I feel like, you know, everybody's in the same position. So Right, right. How can you be that upset when it's just the entire world stopping? Yeah, exactly. And hopefully something good or there will be some sort of silver lining at the end of this yeah so what was abt doing when you guys had to stop when when everyone had to not meet in large groups right we were um we were in the middle of a rehearsal day uh we were about to go on tour to chicago um and we really like, you know, we were, we were continuing with our schedule as planned. Um, we had some other tours that had been canceled, um, but not all of them. So we were um, doing our, our, our repertoire. And then we basically got news that our tour for literally the, the following week got canceled. So um, pretty quickly it escalated. It was one of these things where... Um, the news was changing like by the hour and the company was definitely trying to keep us like abreast, um, on everything that was happening. And then, uh, we had a big company meeting about, um, p potential like other cancellations, but we continued with our day. And then, uh, in the evening, we basically were told that rehearsals and touring would cease to continue. So what was nice is, um, that ABT offered, uh, class in the morning, like as normal the following day. But then after that, the building was going to close around 2 PM. So we all like some of us took ballet class. And then instead of going on to rehearsal, we just, um, packed up our things. Cause we just didn't know. That's so when crazy. We would be yeah. It was, it was very, very surreal. Um, uh, and also hard when you're building just, up momentum for a big show. Did you have something big you were going to do in Chicago? Yeah, um, yeah, we had a mixed mixed repertoire. I was going to do by Adair Shades Trio. Um, you know, then following that, there was a tour to Duke, and I was going to dance Giselle. And uh, so in some ways, I have to really be thankful for the fact that before, let's say, the Washington, D.C. tour got canceled, like I got to do my right. premiere. Um, right. But yeah, it was really crazy because we all looked at each other like, bye, see ya, almost like a summer break situation where you just, you're like, you're like see you next year, but you, you just, we had no idea when we'd see each other again. Right. So really, really unprecedented times. And I feel like you, you know, it's, you know, it's for real when your parents who have lived a lot longer than you <laughs> say that they've never seen anything like this in their yeah. lives. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. For us at yeah. New York City Ballet, we were already on a break. So it seems kind of like we're just having a longer break and I think it'll start, right. it'll start to hit us. And I mean, I think it's hitting some people already, but it'll start yeah. to hit us And I'm hit sorry to hear soon. about the season, by yeah. the way. That's really, I know. again, it's so frustrating. But, um, but you then know, in, in the, pers with, you know, in terms of everything else going on, it seems like small potatoes, you know. Totally. And it's actually hard to believe that we've like, it's been just a couple weeks now. It feels like it's been ages. <laughs> it does feel like it's been forever. Yeah. Um, okay. One of the things I'm really fascinated with you by is your private coaching. And I want to like know yes. more about working with Max and Arena and how that came about and, and kind of also how it works at ABT. Cause I don't know, mm -hmm. like we don't, we don't have coaches so much like that kind of thing at New York City Ballet. So I'm curious just like how the whole engine works at ABT in general, but then how sure. you yeah. kind of like took it on yourself to 
make your dreams happen? Yeah. Well, um, I feel like basically my whole life, my whole training, um, was centered around private, private lessons. Um, I took from David Howard. I took privates from Willie Berman. I took privates from Eva Edvokimova, um, Susan Jaffe. Um, I took from Fabrice Harol. Uh, I took from Valentina up in New York. Kozlova. Yeah, and um, I basically, after I left my kind of smaller hometown school, Scarza Ballet Studio, I followed my um, teacher, Valentina Kozlova, into the city. She opened her own school, and I took private lessons with her for many years, and then I and decided so that, to... at that point, you were not with, like, a regular class setting? Yeah, I would say so. From, like, um, 12 on? From actually probably, like... Yeah, maybe 10, 11, 12. Um, so I, I mean, I was still taking, her school was starting up, so I was taking her classes, but it was a smaller, you know, a smaller class right. of kids, but I really, set, you know, centered my attention on private work. And then and when I left her studio, I kind of had a year of like limbo of trying to figure out where am I going to go? And so I decided, well, I'll just take a class like you know, it won't hurt me to take one class from someone. If I don't like it, I never have to take them again. But usually everyone has something, at least something to offer, one thing to offer. So I took a whole bunch of private lessons from um, all different kind of coaches. So you're doing and like one class a day kind of thing? Or were you doing two? Or how did that work? And how long were the private lessons? Yeah, I would say it was like one, one class a day. Um, and I would take... Uh, maybe like an hour, hour and a half uh, class. I studied with Fabrice Harol for, I think, three or four years. Um, consistently, he was someone who I, I stuck with. And then I basically went to ABT school, JKO. They had just uh, created their elementary division or their intermediate division at the school. And so, um, but I had spoken to Franco DeVito, who was the principal of the school at that time. And I said, look, you know, I, I just want to be above board. You know, that's, I don't want to keep any secrets from you. And, um, you know, I'm training privately outside. So is that okay with you? And he said, yes, he was supportive of it. And, uh, and it's been great. And I basically just continued, continued with that through, through my career too, because I feel like there's just something about having that um, one-on-one -on -one for like a solid two or three hours. Now I'll take a private for a couple hours, just me, um, mm -hmm. just doing variations and it's tiring and it's exhausting, but it's also like <laughs> the amount of time that I need consecutively to feel like to really hammer things into my body and my brain. Um, of course at ABT, we have variations rehearsals, which are one-on-one -on -one with the staff there. But again, for me personally, you know, what I need to just kind of be able to improve my, improve the most is to have like maybe two or three hours at a time. And as you know, at a ballet company, um, having a half hour or even an hour in the schedule is like a huge luxury a big of deal. time. Yeah. A big deal. So, you know, if that's pretty much the max of what can be offered with so many other things being rehearsed at the same time, then I say, okay, I'll take my uh, take one day out of the two days off that I have to be able to okay. go and do my own day of rehearsals. Um, and I have to say that ABT, like Kevin McKenzie, he's super supportive of it. He's like, look, as long as you're improving and as long as, you know, I'm showing up to work at ABT and doing my best, I think he feels that it's probably a symbiotic, um, relationship, you know, between coaches and obviously Irina and Max, uh, danced at ABT as well as print as principals. So it's very helpful because they know the rep. Right. Um, they're my coaches at ABT, like Irina Kopakova, who's in, who's older, a lot older now. Um, she's the one I she, see a lot of people post about, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's, yes, she's the, um, she's kind of a legend, you know, a legend of her time as well. Um, in Russia and uh, she was Irina Max's teacher. Okay. So I feel like it all kind of works out. It's, it's all more or less the same information. Um, it's what's like the cool, same culture continuing. Yeah. 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 And what's cool is that um, Irina and Max, they'll say to me, oh, 
we remember when we did this role, Kevin really likes it this way. Uh So he might ask you to do it like this. And then Irina Kopakova might ask you to do it like that. And then, you know, but we think you should do it how you feel is comfortable. Present both when you get into the studio with them. So it's nice because it's like no one is sitting there telling me this is the only way, the one way to do things. And then it um, kind of like leaves the dialogue open. So you have all this space to kind of experiment with what is your best version and then, yeah. and then you can present it in a strong, with a strong argument. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but you know, of course I have to be willing to, um, be open to changing as well. So if something that I did with Irina and Max is not, let's say Kevin's favorite way of doing something, then of course I'm going to change it. And, and maybe, you know, there've been times where he'll make a suggestion that I'll go back to Irina Max and say, look, you know, Kevin said this and they'll say, oh yeah, that absolutely do that. You know, that looks great too. Like, so, um, so it's nice. It's nice to be able to have that openness just because I've always been a person who doesn't like to, you know, keep secrets from anyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Good for you. I think it's amazing. uh, All of the things that you post and I'm, every time I watch you, I'm just like, you have the most beautiful <sighs> upper body and like the longest neck and like these beautiful shoulders and I oh. just am like so in love. <laughs> oh, so. thanks. <laughs> I'm like seriously, everything you post is so impressive. I'm I, I don't I'm too afraid to post hardly anything of myself. <laughs> oh my god! Well, I literally feel the same about you. Like I think we're all our own worst critics as well. So like, I get it, but you look. Absolutely stunning. Every time I see you, I'm like, wow. I mean, stage, video, doesn't You're matter. Sweet. You're sweet. I'm no, curious, doing all of these private lessons since you were young, did it feel like lonely? I'm like a really social person. And for me, company class is like, the fun of it is being with everybody. Because as a principal or a soloist, you're kind of isolated from sure. the rest of the company all day long. So for me, like company class is this moment where I get to be part of the group. And yeah. and then even like growing up, um, I think like ballet was a place where I felt really accepted socially. Maybe at school, I felt like a little bit out of touch because, you know, being a dancer, you're just so different. Yeah. And then being at, in, in ballet, in a ballet class with my friends was this like, really fun bonding experience. So how, how do you feel about that? Like, I guess maybe, you know, no different. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely isolating. I would have to agree with that. Um, especially growing up as a kid, it was, you're very, um, it's just a very narrow focus. It's you and your teacher, the concentration level is like <laughs> off the hook. Um, but it was nice cause I still went to normal classes when I joined JKO when I was 12 um, then I was in a class with my friends, and uh, and that was really a lot of fun. Um, but I think I knew, like, deep down that for me, in order to achieve the sort of level that I wanted to, that those alone times that maybe weren't so fun or I wasn't really that motivated to be there um, were necessary still anyway. So I tried to work knowing that it would pay off mm-hmm. at some point. Like you always felt like you were getting something that was worth that sacrifice yeah sure yeah um but and then now as an adult you know I I'm so happy to like be it's yeah it's one of the best parts of the job is to be in a community like a community of dancers and have all of your best friends there um joking and laughing yeah and then I know that when Monday rolls around like that's the time that I'm I pretty much leave the house and don't come back till the evening you know and I say, okay, like I'm going to be out all day today running my own errands. Um, so that's your one day off and you're going and doing these private coachings. Yeah. Well, we, we get two days off. Okay. Um, we get Sundays and Mondays off, but on Mondays, generally my schedule, um, is, uh, like Heather Hawk's ballet class at steps, um, Pilates with Clarice Marshall, a two or three hour private with Irina and Max, a session with Choi, um, who's like body worker. Okay. And then I like um, that part. That's my favorite part so far. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> and then like the acupuncturist. And then That's I'm home. That's incredible. Yeah, it's it's a mar- it's a marathon. And sometimes it's like, you know, Sunday nights I'm just like dreading waking up the next morning. But again, you know, it pays off. In a company where you're not completely in charge of your rehearsal schedule each week mm-hmm. or yes. maybe even like your workload. And you don't yeah. necessarily know how it's going to play out. 
how do you take that extra day and work like so intensely when you don't have control over the rest of the days? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I totally know what you mean. Well, I guess, you know, depending on whatever rep we have coming up, I'll be able to say, oh, I know that, you know, we're preparing for um, a mixed bill on tour and I'm only in one of those pieces that's in the triple bill. And, you know, I know generally like what my schedule might look like, but also I've been in a situation where, you know, I'm preparing, let's say for Giselle full length, my debut um, during the week, but then I'm still going to go to those privates on Mondays. So it's just like it, it kind of differs, but I think for me, I'm sort of like one of these all or nothing people. Mm -hmm. And if I don't like make myself do all of it and like do it consistently every Monday, no matter what the rest of the week looks like, then I'll start to get lazy. Do do people really take Sundays off during performance seasons? During performance seasons, uh, yes, we have Sundays off. So you always have two days off. Not during performance season, just during rehearsals, I see. Uh, just yeah. plain rehearsals. And then obviously, yeah, performance season's different. Yeah. That's a little harder to squeeze in a private, um, you know. But you're I, doing I, it. Gen- well, actually, I would say um, because I don't know, like, what the schedule is like during performance time, um, I can't, like, book studios in advance. So even if... Uh, and then obviously I'm not going to dance on my one day off. And right. if that's the only day that I could be guaranteed a time to um, okay. rehearse with Irene and Max, then, you know, I'm, I'm out of luck. Um, okay. But I think that's why on the breaks during the year, I, see. Um, I spend all my time rehearsing things for the Met season so that by the time Met season comes around, I'm prepared for all of the roles and any others that I may or may not be thrown into. Um for that like eight week duration. (laughs) So, um, how did you come to doing Giselle? Was it a conversation you had with Kevin or did you say, I know I'd be good in this and I'm going to prep it? Well, what's funny is, I mean, actually I've never, I never, um, like aspired to do Giselle. It was never a dream role of mine just because I didn't think that I would be good for the role. Um, genuinely I, thought like it wasn't something that I would like be amazing at what's a big full Um, length that you thought that that's something I would do what's an example um an example would be like La Female Garde um you know I thought like maybe that's more tailored or suited to my usual typecasting or kind of thing right I know we're all Um, put in our little box and we feel comfortable there because yeah you you know what they expect of you (laughs) Totally. So yeah, so Giselle was not something that I'd ever, you know, thought about. Um, But what's nice is that at the end of uh, the seasons, each year, I usually like have a meeting with Kevin and I say, well, what should I work on over the summer? We're about to go on a nine week layoff. You know, I do privates. Um, You know, what can I like understudy and prepare for? And I've done this for, you know, many years now. And he's nice enough to say like, oh, why don't you keep your eye on this or that? And so I'll prepare a role, um, even if I know I'm not going to perform it, but just in case, I mean, it's kind of been the nature of my career to have been thrown into things um, on on several, several occasions. So um, I figure it's good to learn the repertoire ahead of time and just have basically a finished product before we even get back to the (laughs) studio, just in case. Yeah. Um, which is hard to do too, because then you're, you know, you're not motivated with an end date or an end goal. Right. Of like, well, I'll perform this during the season. You know, it's it's like very up in the air. Um, but this year, I, or this is last year now, um, I went with a little bit of a different question. Um, I basically said, you know, what will I perform next year instead of what might I perform? It's like, what will I perform? I just felt that I was at a point in my career where. I would maybe have my name on a schedule, um, you know, for a specific show with a partner being prepared ahead of time. And he had mentioned something about keeping a strong eye on Giselle, but it still didn't um, seem like definitive. But I went out of that meeting. I rehearsed Giselle um, for the whole summer. And then when I came back to work, um, it's really, it's actually 
not like me at all to like have meetings um, and be any kind of squeaky wheel. Like it really makes me uncomfortable. And I definitely don't want to um, ask for things and I don't want to be where I'm not wanted or where someone feels like, right. you know, that adds a whole added pressure when you ask for something. Totally. So, um, but this, this last year I said, okay, you know, I'll check in and, and tell him that I've worked on it over the summer. And, and it's going really uh, well. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've just been spending many hours on it. And, um, <laughs> and so I went to him and it seemed like uh, the role was actually maybe not going to be a possibility anymore, um, which, you know, I was, uh, I was disappointed to hear it. So I basically, um, left the meeting by saying, look, uh, we're doing it not only at the Met, we're doing it, um, in Duke, we're doing it in DC. Like, is there any way I could have a show? Like, I'm not even asking to do it in New York city. Um, just one show, and it's and I I totally respect the fact that Giselle is a very coveted role. It's something that ballerinas, you know, do and they hold on to that role. It's very special. Um, and then what's amazing is that he was he managed to find a show for me to do. So I was like so uber thankful for that. And I realized, you know what, it was good you went in and kind of pushed for yourself because otherwise he might not have known exactly how monumental it was for me to feel like I want to do this right. because I'd spent so much time rehearsing it at that point. And, um, and so it was great. And, and then what was so ironic in the end was that I went from having basically zero shows to one show to more shows than anyone else, because I filled in for injury and I uh, made my debut like three days earlier than I was scheduled oh. to with a totally different partner. And, uh, and so then I got to do two shows of it and I was the only one, only person like male or female to do two shows in the end. So that's something that I find wild at ABT that people are rehearsing something that is so all encompassing as a full length ballet, but you'll mm -hmm. only, most people just do one time. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. It's true. It's, it's really, and you know, I think that's why it's so hard sometimes to come by opportunities at ABTs because yeah. our seasons, our performance seasons are, are relatively speaking quite short and we only, you know, we're rotating ballets. So even at the Metropolitan Opera house where we have two months, it's our longest season. It's the most intense 64 shows. Um, even that, you know, it will be eight shows of Swan Lake, eight shows of Giselle, eight shows of wow, whatever. Wow, so you eight shows, so that gives, so everyone does it once. Or? So pretty much everyone does it once if you even, if you do that role. You know, we obviously have more, than, I think we have probably more than eight, you know, principal couples. Right. Um, but yet, and then if you're really, really lucky, you get to do two shows if for whatever reason, you know, you get to repeat, let's say you're the opening night and then you're again the Thursday night or something like this. So yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, I'm learn I'm learning now in my career that not everything is super feels fair or feels like it's based purely on your work ethic right. or what you're producing on stage or in the studio. And sometimes it just takes a little more of a push, which is very uncomfortable for someone like myself, just cause it's not in my nature to be pushy. Um, but it's also a necessary tool, I think probably in any industry, uh, to be able to kind of get those things that you, that you really want. And I try to do it in the most, um, you know, in a way where I can go home and go to sleep with myself right. at night because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important to me to feel like I'm being ethical and fair. Right. And right. unfortunately, um, I think that, directors and people in positions of giving those chances appreciate that when you're just honest and you're right. just coming from a place of you know being genuine and um right. so I just I, it's how I try to uh approach my my professional work I well would say. And, and with you it's backed up by a lot of work and and a lot of homework that you put into it so it's not just yeah. like an ask but I've definitely learned that for myself too like I, I feel exactly the same way that you have felt where mm -hmm. you, you don't want to ruffle any feathers and you're like, yeah. well, if I'm supposed to be writing it, they'll just, they'll just pick me and find me one day and it'll just all work out. And, 
And yeah. eventually, as you get older, you realize you have to sell yourself. You have to advertise what you're good at. Look, I yeah. I do this really well, and I could do you know I'd love to do yeah. that or something. Or and even yeah. as you get even older, like me, because I know I'm older. Uh-huh. Than, um, uh-huh. uh, is that sometimes you have to let people know what you're interested in doing? Because then you get to a certain age, and people think, oh, she probably doesn't want to spend her time doing that. And then now yeah. I'm realizing, oh, I have to like let people know, like. I still really want to like master that and something they'd think sure. that I wouldn't even care to be doing. So that's another interesting yeah, totally. moment. How old are you, by the way? Just totally. so everyone. I'm 27. Oh my God, you're 27. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah. And tell me about how you got promoted to soloist and like, did you see it coming? How does Kevin promote people? So yeah. Um, my promotion to soloist was, um, I was really hopeful that it would happen the year that, um, that it did happen because at that time I was being worked to death. Literally I was doing, you know, all of my core work, um, my soloist work, my principal work. And then I was filling in for injury for other core soloists and principals. Um, so I was doing the work of like 10 people in one. And how old Um, were you that, that year? Oh God, that was, I think I was, that was, maybe I was like 23 or something, 22 or 23. And had Um, had you been in the company since you were like 17? Yes. Yes. And, uh, so I, just remember being like, so at my wits end, emotionally, physically, mentally, I was going on stage and trying to make an impression every single time. That's a lot of pressure. (laughs) Yeah. And, and including my core work. I mean, I've seen plenty of people when they go on and do their core work, they give it no thought and no effort. And then they just only try when they do their soloist and principal work. But for me, that's so not my standard, like that, you know, I need to look like I'm, I need to feel like a principal dancer every time I step on stage, even if I was, you know, just a tree in the background. So (laughs) it was really important to me to like uphold a standard um, with every job that I was being asked to do. But it was getting to a point where I like was really cracking not even so much under the pressure, but just under the the strain of how much I was doing. And as a person, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. I was a person that never got injured. So they just keep putting you out there and keep trying you and keep pushing you to do things. And there's there are physical limitations that unless you're out, out, you right. can't, right. you know. So um, I basically was pretty much prepared, like depending on what, what the announcement was that year, I was prepared to, to go and start exploring my options. And, um, the way that Kevin announces promotions is, is a lot of fun. There's usually at like the last week of the Met, there's, um, a like full company meeting and that's, everybody knows, okay, that's when, he you know, oh, wow. so it's, it's and, always at the same time. Pretty much. Yeah. I think on occasion, um, like historically there have been moments where Kevin's promoted people mid year, like in January or something like that, but it tends to be, um, like at the end of the Met season and he, he'll finish out a meeting. You know, everybody's like so nervous and he'll finish out a meeting, um, by saying like, and I'd also like to congratulate so-and-so on their promotion to soloist or so-and-so on their promotion. And that's when you first hear it. Yeah, and everybody's like screaming and oh my crying. God. It's, and then it's, there's it's, some people that are probably really upset. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's and I think hard. Everyone's it's hard. dealing with it in front of each other. Yeah, but I think what's nice is that, um, from what I understand from you know some other people who have mentioned their experiences in the past, um, Kevin definitely has the sensitivity to sometimes let somebody know like before that meeting happens, Hey, by the way, you're not going to be promoted this year. I just want to let you know, it gives, it even gives that person the chance to not attend the meeting if they feel like it's going to be too emotional for them. Um, but he'll sometimes give a heads up to people who, 
uh, who might not be getting promoted yet. And I think that's a really nice thing to do because then it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, I see all the time people think they were in line for it and then it doesn't happen and then they lose all hope. And it's like, no, you got to just stay the course. You're next. You got to. Yes. It's a game of survivor. And if you give up now, it's, you're just one step away. It happens so often. Right. It's true. It's true. And I think that's why it's so nice to have a director like Kevin, who's pretty much, he feel he's very approachable. So he's, it feels like you can go and, and talk to him and ask him questions and, um, that he can give you some sort of feeling or direction about. Do you guys ever feel though, headed. this happens sometimes where you're getting a response that's, you know, what they want you to hear, but not necessarily the real truth. That's hard because you can't, as a ballet yeah. director, always give great news. Not everyone can do those eight shows of Snow right. Lake. Right. I think. I think. Um, yeah. I think that Kevin's like generally pretty forthcoming, um, <clears throat> and you know he's always respectful, and or at least this is in my experience. Um, but but yeah, so he'll announce uh, announce it in front of everyone. One. and it's like a lot of fun and a lot of just family support and I feel like actually for me uh, my transition to solos was really really difficult I actually didn't expect at all to feel the way I felt um, which was at first you know I was mostly just relieved I didn't even it's not even as if I really needed the title of being soloist I just thought okay I'm not going to be on stage as much. I'm not going to be like work to death. I'm going to be able to be feel more normal. And I went from working like crazy to now you only have maybe one or two shows max right. a week. And all of a sudden I felt totally useless. I felt like kind of unfulfilled. I felt because my my association with hard work the for the previous like 3 or 4 years was just doing the most, being on stage all the time, feeling exhausted. And for the first time, I wasn't exhausted. I wasn't learning everything. Um, I was just focusing on the soloist and principal parts that I was doing. And, you know, that was really kind of like a wake-up call of, okay, now how do you find fulfillment in being on stage a lot less? Right. Um, so it was really hard. I was very, very sad. I I felt, I experienced, I definitely experienced a low because it was something again that like, I wasn't anticipating to feel quite like such a void. Yeah. I think that's super common that we have the same thing at New York City Ballet. How do you recommend for people to get through it? Well, um, I try to then say, okay, you know, maybe I'll take more privates now during the week even. And, um, I'll continue to prepare myself now for full length principal roles. So maybe in the core, I used to um, prepare soloist roles like the Pot of Twan Swan Lake okay. or, um, you know, Shades Variation from La Bayadere. But now I've said, okay, well, maybe I should start to, for fun, learn Kitri or learn, um, you know, Romeo and Juliet or. Th- things like that. So, uh, that's kind of how I stayed stimulated and it, it did, there was an adjustment period. It definitely did take me some time to come around and feel comfortable in my new role. Have you ever noticed if you've decided to work on something and someone finds out that does that role, do you ever feel like a, this is mine, don't take my, my rep or do you ever feel that pushback? You know, um, I've always been really, I think, conscious of not practicing my roles, like like roles that I would just pick out of a hat that belong to other older, more mature and seasoned dancers um, ever at like ABT Studios on a normal work day or work time. I've always, you know, worked on those things on my day off when no one's around. I've rented a studio somewhere that's not even at ABT and you know I I actually had that thought go through my head when I started to like post videos of myself on Instagram um, because I just thought I really hope I'm not offending anyone or making feel anyone uncomfortable like I'm coming for their job right because it's such a seniority thing 
Yeah. And people get so um, protective of it. And there's yeah. only so many parts. Right. But it's also really an inspiring thing. So that's interesting well, how you worked it out. Yeah. And I think my justification as well for why I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm not really hiding it is because I have been called on so many times to fill in for these exact people right. for <laughs> roles that they've done. So really, yeah. I think to myself, like, who could blame me for continuing to learn the entire repertoire because there's like my track record shows that there's a pretty good chance that I might actually have to go on stage. Um, but, but yeah, I, I've not experienced any kind of, um, at least to my face, like any kind of, uh, pushback from the older dancers. If anything, they've been nothing but supportive and complimentary and, um, that's great. I have the utmost respect for them too. So maybe that helps that I, I, I do revere them. Right. Right. So, um, you like being such an incredibly hard worker, how are you dealing with being stuck inside for so long? I I feel like (laughs) that's something people be interested in. How does someone like you who barely even takes a day off and what do you, what are you doing? Like, do you do like Pilates mat exercises? Like what is your like exercise program right now? Yeah, I do. I, I do Pilates um, just for maintenance for my body because I can't go and take Pilates with my teacher anymore. Um, I take a ballet class uh, pretty much every day. But I feel like when I have um, moments of like quietness force on me, it could be from injury, like when you have to take time, you're forced to take time off for injury or something crazy like this, Corona, where we're all forced to be quarantined. I try to say to myself, look, like you have no choice. You have to take this time off to either heal or not be outside or whatever the case might be. So you might as well enjoy it. Good. And so I feel like, you know, I'm trying to um, relax and and take this time to like enjoy what I can do for the time being. And it's it is extremely frustrating to have lost momentum, especially right. especially for me. You know, I felt right. like yeah, oh, it's just such a huge high. Yeah, I was like, wow, I did these shows, uh, two shows in D.C. I'm going to do another show at Duke. Like, we have the whole Met season ahead of us. And especially when you feel like, um, you know, maybe this is my year. Like, all of a sudden to have all that come to a total stop and then have the uncertainty of when are we going to get back to it and what is going to be the state of of finances like both at the company but around I mean for everyone around the world it's all of a sudden everything looks so you know uncertain and for someone like me who's a bit of a control freak in the sense that I like to like be in control of my destiny um it's very hard to like cope with the fact that I I have no idea what's on the other side of this right right it's a crazy time so crazy. <laughs> let, me, let me make sure I asked all of the things. I just think you're so inspiring. I'm like loving hearing you talk. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> How have you been spending your time? <laughs> well, I came off of a crazy, like straight four or five months of insane dancing school, you know, having a, with, wow. a, with a baby. Oh. And so I actually, yeah. when, when this happened, the first two weeks, I've been like, oh, <laughs> just because yeah. I, I needed a little bit of a slowdown. Um, so actually, course. I took uh, two weeks of no dancing. Good. And then I like have a little studio here. I can go in by myself through a back door and not see anybody. And the other part of the school is just teachers in rooms recording for their students. Sure. For like Zoom classes. So I, I don't see anybody and I can go do that. But I'm only going to do it a couple times a week. Like I'm not going to kill myself and... No, and nor should you, because also, again, we have no idea when we're back, so yeah. it's not like I'm, you're, like... I'm thinking I'm in this for the long haul. I don't want to, like, get too sick of it too soon. I totally understand what you mean. You know? Yeah. And I only it's, brought two pairs of point shoes here, so... <laughs> well, there you go. You can't, like... <laughs> they can't be dead too soon. <laughs> no, no. So I haven't even got on point yet, but my body needed this. My Achilles had been hurting me. That's a good question, actually. What... Mm. Um, what do you struggle with with your body injury wise and what do you have to like watch out for and and how do you maintain that well i'm a pretty um i would say my body's pretty like durable i think because 
like I don't have crazy feet, like I don't have crazy extension, you know, I'm not like a double jointed person or anything, like I'm pretty kind of like sturdy. You don't have hypermobile um, joints. Not, yeah, yeah, not really. Me either. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so in a way, it's nice because I feel like my body is just protected from some of those things that other very gifted people um, have to deal with. But I, I would say, like probably five years ago now, I had a uh, a back injury, and I just remember feeling one day like my back was kind of sore or tight, and so I thought, oh, okay, you know, I'll just stretch it. And it was like not really going away for a couple weeks. I just kept stretching and stretching it. And I hadn't, you know, it just felt like normal soreness. So one morning I woke up and I could not lower my chin without feeling a zing all the way from like the bottom of my back to the top of my head. So what did I do? I just decided, okay, I'm going to get ready for work now. And I got dressed. I like it. It took all of my might to be able to even bend down and, like, put my shoes on. I go to work. It's, like, excruciating to even pull up tights. I mean, they're, like, so – it's hard anyway, (laughs) you know? So – but then on top of it, to have this, like, weird pain in my back, I just – and I went to class. And then I – mid, like, tendus at bar, I said, yeah, nope, I can't ignore what my body's telling me anymore. I should go to PT. So I went. I got PT and the physical therapist was like, you need an MRI today. You know, we, there's something, something's up. So I got up off her table and like my entire back just like seized, grabbed everywhere to a point where I was almost like lightheaded. I almost felt like I was going to fall down because it was such a jarring sensation. So I called my mom. I was like, you need to come pick me up in a cab and take yeah. me to Dr. Bowman. And I got an MRI and I found out that I had a herniated disc. Uh, which so one? it was like, I think it's between L4 and L5. And so then I took probably a month off. It was really just a month um, before I went back to work. And that's fast. It was pretty fast. It was probably faster than I should have gone back, but I was trying to be, you know, I, I went back smartly and definitely. Was this pre promotion? This was actually post-promotion. And then I remember being in school. uh, I was probably like 12, 13, 14 years old. And ABT at their summer programs and at JKO, they would offer yoga and Pilates classes. And every time I took a Pilates class, I would either have a laughing attack with my friends or I'd basically close my eyes and go to sleep. I like had zero, uh, I, I had zero knowledge of why this was beneficial for me, how doing like, you know, marching on your back or like pelvic lifts or anything was going to benefit my dancing. Right. And I just didn't take it seriously. And then flash forward like, you know, 15 years and all of a sudden I'm back with that same Pilates teacher who taught (laughs) me when I was younger. And I said, I said to her, I said, Clears, can you believe I used to take a nap in your class? And now I'm here and like, I won't do a week of dancing without a Pilates session with you, um, at least once a week. So it's kind of, I learned the hard way. Um, but now Pilates and getting massage, like all of that good stuff is definitely a part of my weekly routine and how I practice injury prevention. It's of course, like an investment in myself. It's obviously not cheap to have to practice that maintenance. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to, again, look at how it's going to pay off in the long run. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I find, I definitely find the value in it. I'm so glad you got better. That's like, that's a scary injury. Yeah. And it's an injury that doesn't heal either. Like there's no such thing as your herniated disc healing unless you're going to have surgery or something. So So what is it? They're just looking for it to kind of go back, but like you always have to watch it. Yeah, I think it's just that, you know, all of a sudden the muscle supporting muscles like through PT kind of build up around uh-huh. you, around it and then help to support you while you're dancing. Then you're not relying on the things that might pull at that disc. Oh, interesting. Um, after the fact. That's interesting. So, yeah, I, I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah, that's so scary when it's the back. I had a neck thing that once I got the MRI back, I was like... I had like three herniated discs in yeah. my neck. I was like, what? Who but knew? yeah, 
but that's that's what like I feel like a lot of doctors have told me. You know, it's actually not uncommon for people to have herniations and they don't even know it. Like, yeah, because yeah, it's actually like pretty common. But the fact that we're dancers and we're so in tune with our bodies and we're having to move the way we move, right? And it's all about your symptoms. It. So if you're having symptoms, then it's important. If, yes. Right. So. Yes, completely. Yeah. Agree. Um, yeah. Uh, quickly tell us about your amazing aerobic mother, aerobic oh workout mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my mom, she's like, she's, she's super cool. Um, she was actually a pretty like famous fitness trainer of her time back in the eighties and nineties. Um, she, her class, like she had a class, a workout class <clears throat> that she did at the health club and she, um, it was like David Howard's class. It was packed. <laughs> People had their spots in the room that they wanted to stand. And her class was so popular that they actually sold, um, spots in her class. People would take it from the hallway. As long as they could see into the studio and see my mom, people were taking her class outside in the hallway. Um, is this in so, the eighties? Yeah, and she she said it was just like the hottest pickup joint in New York. Like women would come with these thong leotards, men would come in sh mess shorts with like no underwear on, and people were just exchanging numbers after class, like afterward, um, because her class was it was like it was almost like jazzercise before jazzercise existed, and um, it was a lot of hip movement and a lot of sweating, good music, so. People really, really loved it. She ended up um, going on the Regis show like at least twice or three times. She uh, trained Cindy Lauper, John McEnroe. Uh, she was the trainer for Good Morning America host Joan London and did workout. Like we have a workout VHS tape, like an hour long of her giving a workout class. Um, she was just, yeah, she had this like very magnetic personality. And I think because she's always been a great speaker um, and very confident and kind of like, if you know her, she's super bubbly and like has a great spirit. So she could really sell anything. Right. Um, a really, I guess a quick story for you <laughs> is that one of the times that she was going on the Regis show, she was going to teach a, uh, a class in, I think, like, Taekwondo or something. And she didn't know anything about Taekwondo. She just said, oh, let's do a segment on self-defense. And she said, you know, my my sister's boyfriend right now is, like, a black belt in whatever. I'll just ask him, like, what are some tips? And my dad's going, are you sure you want to go on live television, like, not knowing <laughs> anything about self-defense and give a whole segment on self-defense? It's like, yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. So she's, uh, she basically was backstage with the co-host. At that time, um, Regis, I guess, had like hurt his back moving or something that weekend. So the co-host, his co-host was going to do the segment with her. And the co-host seemed to maybe like not really know um, exactly what she should be asking my mom. So my mom's going, okay, you're going to ask me this. And then you're going to ask me that. And then when I see this, it's going to, like, she was telling the co-host, this is how it's going to go. And they're counting down, you know, to be live, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And then it was like, you're on. And I guess the co-host um, maybe, like, didn't feel confident in the segment. So she looked at Regis, who was sitting in the audience, watching watching the segment. She said, Oh, Regis, you know, do you want to come up and uh, and help Barbara or, like, do the segment with Barbara on self-defense? So at that point, Regis was not very happy that she called him up with his bad back or whatever he had. And he's going, so, Barbara, uh, you know, what would happen if I came up behind you and I got you in a lock like this? And, you know, he positioned himself in a way where it's like if you're actually being attacked on the street... <laughs> Nobody would have the time to, like, get you in a grip like he did, like a pretzel. <laughs> and she's going, well, Regis, I guess I would kick you in the groin. And he goes, kick me in the groin, kick me in the groin. Oh, she'd kick me in the groin. And then he's going, okay, well, now, now what if I would get you like this? And there were these impossible, she didn't know what she was necessarily talking about. So she says, well, Regis, I guess I'd kick you in the groin. <laughs> So now, flash forward, like, 20 years, we're watching Miss Congeniality 2, I think, in the movie theater, 
And literally, there is a part where um, I think Sandra Bullock is on, on the Regis show doing a segment about self-defense. And at one point in the movie, she's going, well, Regis, I guess I'd kick you in the groin. And it was literally pulled straight from like my mom's segment on the Regis show um, 20 years prior. That is amazing. Um, but she's, yeah, she's like, yeah, she's one of these people. Who she's a legend. Just, yeah, she's she's pretty she's pretty legendary and, and <laughs> she loves to move. So I love your mom. That's her, yeah. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> That's a great, great. story. <laughs> um, and one last thing, what would you what advice would you give to young dancers that are working so hard and trying so hard and like what what do you wish you had done for yourself or told yourself or maybe been more gentle about like Yeah. Well, um, I would say that for dancers, I think especially now of this generation, it's really easy to get hung up on like Instagram and um, not necessarily putting in all the work in the studio and having things kind of handed to you or having your parents do your work for you, you know, if they're helicopter parents now and things like that. So I think that, you know, for the students who are working hard, it's like, great, keep doing that. And for the students who think that the art form exists online, right. it really doesn't. And, um, you know, especially for those who maybe have things coming naturally for them or easily to them, I would say don't settle because uh, there's always room to improve. And it's definitely a diligence that is important to maintain and hold on to. And, um, and yeah, it's really the hard work. And and I think what I would have liked to have known when I was younger is that, yes, Sky, like it's so difficult to be in the studio sometimes and miss that sleepover or uh, not do gym or uh, go to dance after doing hours of homework a day, like that it will pay off. So um, I guess, yeah, I think hard work is key and uh making it count is key. That's awesome. Thank you for yeah. taking the time and of course. sharing your story with everybody. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm like so honored to be the, <laughs> the first podcast guest. Ho hopefully it makes it online somehow. I'm, I'm going to yeah. work on my YouTubing skills. So <laughs> Cool. Well, I'll be like your first viewer. <laughs> and say hi to your family. I will. Yeah, likewise. And, and be safe. Thank you. I miss you. Miss you too. <laughs> Have a good one. You too. Bye.